I have an article here on <laughs> that says, don't panic, go organic. The IPC report should be a wake-up call for climate smart food. And it basically talks about four climate smart food strategies to help with global warming. And one is to reduce food waste, one is to protect the oceans, one is to grow and eat food that's real food, and one of them is to guard the soil. And it talks about how the soil is a strategy to protect against climate change. It says across the planet, ecosystems on the land, soil, forest, prairies about, absorb about one third of the greenhouse gases humans emit each year. Through, through protecting forests is often presented as a frontline strategy, strategy to reduce emissions. Soil, soil stores even more carbon than our forests. Healthy soils, therefore, are essential in absorbing already emitted carbon dioxide. What's more, industrial agricultural practices now going global, including synthetic fertilizer, monocropping, chemical use, and tillage, destroy soil carbon, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Much of the farmland across our Midwest that had levels of 20% carbon as recently as the 1950s now contain only 1% or 2%, according to the Pennsylvania-based Rodale Institute. And it goes on. Do you want to speak about how the soil is a strategy, keeping the soil good is a strategy for protecting against climate change? Um, sure, I can uh, speak to that a little bit. The, um, not a lot of people know that uh, back in 1978, there was a study that showed that about one-third of the CO2 that had been added uh, to the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution actually came from plowing up the plains, um, and not just in North America, but in Asia and in uh, Eastern Europe as well. Mm. Um, and what happens is you, if there's a lot of organic matter in the soil, when the soil gets uh, plowed up, some of it gets oxidized. Um, and the soil organic matter content of the world's agricultural soils have gone down a lot over the last 150 years or so. Um, now, if we had strategies to put organic matter back on the land to either retain crop stubble and sort of keep harvesting part of the organic matter that we're growing on our fields or even bring organic matter back to the land, you could arguably, arguably increase soil organic matter contents fairly dramatically over some period of decades and depending on the practices and the crops and the region and the climate and all that. Um, but if you look at the total amount of carbon that's stored in the world of soils, it's about twice what's in the atmosphere. Um, the soil is a really big reservoir for carbon. And it can hold a lot more than it has in it today. It's lost a lot, as I said, in the last couple hundred years. We could actually start thinking in terms of our regenerative agricultural practices that I was talking about earlier. What's one of the best things you could do to restore the native fertility to soils? It's increasing the soil organic carbon content. Why? Well, because that is part of the food for all the microbial life that I was talking about this morning that is actually the natural engine for fertility. So here you have an example of something where you know, the same action trying to rebuild the carbon content in soils will not only help us rebuild the native fertility of soils, but it will also help sequester carbon. Um, that's kind of a thing where it's, it's a two for one, in effect. Um, it's a fairly rational thing to try and do. There's, there's different estimates of how much carbon could actually be parked in the world's soils, and, it, and they range from fairly low to fairly high. I'll spare you the sort of the numbers. It depends really what you're willing to assume about the nature of agricultural practices, how they may change, how efficient they are, and what kind of means you're using to try and get carbon back into the soil. Um, but in terms of just a, a potential strategy for actually helping to reduce the potential impact from increases in atmospheric CO2, you know, that's one strategy where we could be doing that anyway simply to rebuild soil fertility. Um, the, the, carbon, the, the climate aspect to it could either be viewed as the primary driver if you're most worried about that or as just a nice bonus if you're more worried about soil fertility. So a friend of mine, John Wicks, is a, um, a farmer in my county called uh, Marin County, California, and we were kind of a grass-fed um, agriculture there. So we have a lot of pasture management. We have a lot, most of it's organic dairies. But uh, he wanted to find out, were there pasturing practices that would sequester carbon? So he started changing the way cows were allowed to graze. And he, he set up these different fields, and he partnered up with UC Berkeley and started measuring. And I went out there to write about this, and he, and he measured, he, it, technically, and has done some good peer-reviewed study now that shows um, that uh, he increased the carbon sequestration of the grasses. He was using native grasses, but he basically did it 
by, um, by not allowing the cows free range. Uh, they, they were located in one area and then they deposit, speaking of your other subject there, <laughs> they, they deposit their, their waste on the field and that's a big part of it, but then he also composts that. So he had a composting um, and a grazing technique which increased the carbon by uh, quite a bit. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you the numbers. But basically what John said was that he felt, and I can't, and I'm not saying this has been validated by science, but he felt that they could take out all the legacy carbon as well as all the new carbon that was going into the air and that just changing pasturing and grazing techniques would make a significant impact on climate change in wherever they were introduced. So if you want to look that up, I can give you the resource for that. And the other person I want to mention that I write about in my book is Wes Jackson um, at the Land Institute in Kansas. And uh, he has a wonderful picture on their website which shows most of the way grasses that are, you know, used in industrial agriculture and their roots are about like this, this long, right? And then he has the perennial grasses of the prairie and, and you have to stand up and hold, you've seen this picture, you have to stand up and hold it because it's like many, many, many like feet so long. long. Yeah, it's just this yeah. glorious this glorious thing. Who was it at this conference that talked, was it you that talked about the roots as the digestive system? Of the, oh, that was beautiful. I love these analogies. Um, but, um, but these roots are what we need, you know, so we need to go deep rooted. We need to go deeply rooted agriculture would be it. So the political fix for this, I'm going to go back to this, is to fix the farm bill and to start putting the research money and start putting the conservation practices into our subsidies and, and correct the problem. It's a pretty darn easy fix, actually. People do know what to do. It's just that the people who want to do something else are in charge. Uh, I have a question for the panel. <laughs> um, and this may be a bit tangential, but um, what about hydroponics? And what about this food tower we see here uh, in our midst, which is plants growing in just water and sunlight or even artificial light? Is this um, helpful in some of these problems of running out of soil that we've been talking about? Is it sort of a, a way of saving us till we figure out uh, how to grow the soil back? Or are there positives and negatives to this kind of food production? You want to go first? Oh, um, I have friends that know people who, grow, who have a, a fish farm in their bathtub in the cities. You know, I think wherever you can grow food's a good idea. You just be clever about it. This is all really good. Growing food is wonderful. It's, it's um, fun for kids to do. Just do it wherever you can. But I don't think, it's, I don't think it addresses the soil problem at all. So I like, I, like, I like ideas. I think they're very good. I think if you want to grow something, you should do it, even if it means growing mold on your food in your refrigerators. But... <laughs> eventually put them in your compost pile and get them out into the dirt. And I sneak food out into, into commercial areas. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, get to, get the, take the wrapper off your lunch and put it under a tree, you know? I mean, just give the worth a hand once in a while. We can, so do, we, do, we can do both. It's, I, I, either or thinking is not going to help us in this case, I think. Yeah, I mean, what the, in terms of a downside to hydroponics, you still need to get the nutrients from somewhere. So, ah, good point. I was thinking water and sunlight's not enough. Well, yeah, water, and so you, it, depending on how you get the minerals, uh, what kind of energy you need to actually run the facility, the energetics may or may not pan out. But you still, if you're bringing in, well, it depends where you're getting the other nutrients is actually a big question. And so for some crops in some circumstances, or for small-scale home production, it could make a lot of sense. And, turn, and I think that urban agriculture has a future to play in agriculture. Yeah. But what form that's going to take, may not really be clear yet in terms of how, well, I mean, the two things that, well, one thing that we have a surplus of in the urban environment uh, is organic waste. Um, you know, we produce a lot of it, uh, both from the food we don't eat and also from the food we do eat, to go back to that subject. Um, and what we do with it now in terms of taking a very rich nutrient source and basically flushing it to the sea is kind of crazy in the large scale view of things. And so one of the things I think we're gonna have to rethink over the next century or two is how to close the nutrient loop to actually get the nutrients that are we're processing through cities back out to the rural environment, or maybe integrating them into urban farms. Um, but we need to have a discussion at a, at a societal level about what to do with our waste stream. Because um, if we go back 200 years, it was totally different than it is today. 
we can be sure that 200 years from now it'll be totally different, but we ought to be approaching it in a very rational way to, to take advantage of the opportunity as we update infrastructure to actually make sure we're starting to close the nutrient loop that has to be the foundation for any truly long-term sustainable agriculture. Wonderful. If, if we're eating simple carbs, and that's bad for us, and complex carbs are good for us, but they're all made of carbon, uh, if we recycle or compost the waste from a fast food restaurant, is that a good thing, or is that making bad compost? Is that before or after you eat it? <laughs> we'll take before first. I don't have an opinion on that. Um, <laughs> All waste is good. I mean, one, one of the issues that I've uh, run across concern about in terms of composting urban waste is what about all the pharmaceuticals and, and other things that are in what we, what, that come out after we take them in. Um, and some of the people I've talked to who have been running sort of large-scale composting operations basically have been doing the studies that show that if you compost right, that stuff all gets broken down. Even the antibiotics get broken down. They may kill some of the microbes in the composting, but then they get broken down and metabolized themselves. And so I, I think that, again, we're back to sort of figuring out methods and techniques to actually adapt that and do that at, at scale. Um, but that there's ways to do it that um, we'd be wise to, to look into and try and take advantage of. Are you familiar with the work of Paul Stamets? Yes. Yeah, and so let's give a shout out for mushrooms in the fungal nation because they um, have turned out, because one of the things that's been the most difficult is like diesel and radioactive waste and some of these other, and so I had a kind of a snarky comment there, all waste is good, but it's true that there's gonna always be a natural response, which is why it's kind of interesting and fun to think about these issues. And, and he has discovered certain fungal, fungi, fun, he's a fungi, um, fungi that will, uh, de will recycle and uh, degrade and renew uh, almost everything that we consider toxic now. So for every problem, there's a natural solution. <laughs>